Dr. Thomas. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the inquiry. Um, you, you are talking not just to those who, who are here uh, to listen, uh, but also, uh, and in particular, uh, to a, a much wider audience, probably numbering about 100, um, who will be listening remotely. So that's your audience. Uh, Mary will invite you to, uh, to take the affirmation in, in a moment, uh, and then Ms. Scott will ask you the, the questions. Mary. Please state your full name. David Wynn Thomas. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Dr. Thomas, I'm going to start by <clears throat> running through the salient points of your, of your career. So you qualified from the Welsh National School of Medicine in July 1978, um, and you then spent two years as a medical senior house officer uh, between August 1979 and August 1981. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, you commenced your anaesthesia and intensive care training um, uh, at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, uh, where you were until spring 1983, uh, then taking up a post as registrar in an uh, anaesthesia and intensive care at the Nuffield Department of Anaesthetics in Oxford, uh, a post that you held until April 1985. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, then in April 1985, you became a senior registrar uh, at Swansea and Cardiff um, uh, uh, until February 1989, um, and uh, while you were there, you spent a year at the Flinders Medical Centre on an intensive care and chronic pain fellowship in Adelaide, Australia, um, between uh, January 1987 and March 1988. Quarter. Um, and then in uh, uh, February 1989, you became a consultant in anaesthesia with a special interest in intensive care. Uh, and you were based at the Singleton and Morriston hospitals in Cardiff. In Swansea. In Swansea, Swansea. I beg your pardon, in Swansea. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you were, the, uh, you were um, involved with treating adults in, in ICU, uh, not, not, not in paediatric ICU, is that, is that correct? That's correct, but initially there were some paediatric patients before that service was relocated to Cardiff but my experience was very limited while at Swansea. Um, can you just tell us broadly what the responsibilities of an anaesthetist on, on ICU were or are? Well, clearly the skills of an anaesthetist are, are needed uh, for <coughs> place, placing patients on ventilators, uh, supervising their renal dialysis, and in fact, gaining venous access and arterial access to their cardiovascular system. So all those skills are, are complementary. Uh, the skills I learned in the job was in fact coordinating a multidisciplinary team and calling on expertise when I needed it. We could do the practical emergency interventions, but often needed to be a sort of conductor of an orchestra of various clinicians to try and get the best care for the patients. And I'll come on and ask you some more questions about your, your practice in relation to, in particular, blood transfusions on ICU in due course later this afternoon. Um, you, you've set out in your statement as um, a, a number of the um, positions that you held in addition to uh, the uh, clinical uh, positions I've, I, I, we, we've just gone through. So between 1999 and 2003... You were a college tutor and deputy regional educational advisor. Is that correct? Who was that for? That's for the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Um, and also a regional advisor for the Royal College of Anaesthetists between 2002 and 2005. That's right, for, uh, and for the whole of Wales. For the whole of Wales. A, a regional advisor to the, to the College of Anaesthetists, is, is, what, 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 was, what were you called upon to do in that role? Well, there were about, uh, at the end of that, that 
role, about 125 registrars who um, I was responsible for overseeing their education, not directly or personally, but, but administrating that within Wales and their progress and assessing their progress throughout their training. Uh, you were also the sec secretary for the, for the Society of Anaesthetists in Wales uh, for, for three years. Um, joint founder of the South Wales Anaesthetic Course. Um, uh, what, was, what, what was that course? Who, who was that? That was again for anaesthetists, uh, to avoid them having to travel either to London or at the time Bristol to get their, their, their crammer course, really, for, to pass their Royal College exams. So that was a, that was a position for the Royal College of Anaesthetists? Well, it was a... a, a a role that w was combined with a local educational course run for registrars within Wales. Um, you were also the chair of the Patient Safety Board um, for the National Wealth Informatics Service Examiner. Is, no, is, National Wales Informatics Service. Yes. Is, is, is that the chair of the Patient Safety Board for the National Wales... Yes. Informatics yes. Service Examiner for yes. primary... My, my involvement in transfusion issues, which we'll come on to later, identified uh, a, a paucity of, of correct recognition of the patient. And with the implementation of IT uh, into, into the NHS, it was clear that there needed to be safeguards about the processes that were in place. And as such, I was invited to chair patient safety board for that service and uh, I may come on to ask you some questions about that in due course um, you've also told us in your statement that you were chair of the rational blood committee in the late 1990s until it was restructured but restructured by the Welsh government what was the rational blood committee it was a, a collection I worked closely with the regional blood service which in fact was the Welsh national blood service um, to try and draw clinicians together to look at uh, the best use of blood in a clinical environment. And so I chaired that, that group, which met, I think, three times a year, um, feeding back certain local audits and usage figures. Uh, and you were also chair of the Blood Implema Implementation Group for the Welsh Assembly from 2005. What did that role in entail? Well, there was a, a group of individuals appointed a uh, better blood transfusion team, and I in part supervised and uh, administered that uh, involvement within, uh, again, based in hospitals, the, the, the group, and they looked at uh, better use of, of blood transfusion products. So that, that was a group coming out of the Chief Medical Officer's Better Blood Transfusion Initiative and conferences yes, and so yes. on? Yes, yes. Uh, and the ch you, you also, from 2005, were chair of the Clinical Advisory Group. What, what was that group? Again, that was mainly, ra rather than the users of blood, it was represented from most of the Royal Colleges uh, for surgery, medicine. Again, uh, a more uh, erudite group of people, or so they thought, uh, who then could try and infiltrate their own specialties with the guidelines and recommendations we were trying to put forward. And was that UK-wide or a Welsh? That was just in, in Wales. Just in Wales. And again, coming out of the Chief Medical Officer's Better Blood Transfusion yes, Initiative. Yes, yes. Uh, and you were also a member of the Blood Policy Group 9 from 2005. What, what's that? That, that was a, a more select group of politicians and CMOs where we tried to, to look at the policies that we would try and implement across an always basis. The, the, the introduction of... of Nucleic acid testing, for example, was a decision made after consultation with both the UK government and SAPTO as to whether that should be a policy we should adapt in Wales. Um, you were an invited observer on the National Blood Transfusion Committee. Um, and from 2001, you were a member of the Appropriate Use of Blood Committee um, uh, you were also a member of the Autologist Transfusion Working Party um, and the Autologist Transfusion Special Interest Group um, for the British Blood Transfusion Society, mm -hmm. uh, a council member and then president of the British Blood Transfusion Society. 
and a board member of the Network for the Advancement of Transfusion Alternatives, as well as chair of that organisation from 2013 to 2017. Yes. And you're also chair of the Serious Hazards of Transfusion Steering Group from 2012 to 2017, and a co-opted member of the International Society of Blood Transfusion um, Organising Committee. Um, uh, and you retired in March 2020. I did. Um, I'm going to start um, now by uh, go on now to ask you some questions about your understanding and knowledge of, of the risk of viral transmission via blood. Can you, casting your mind back, recall what you were taught at medical school about transfusion policy generally and uh, the risk of uh, viral transmission? Uh, via blood in particular? It may be my, uh, my memory, but I know for certain that uh, during my undergraduate time, I had six tutorials in haematology. Um, none of them related to transfusion. And so my knowledge of, of viral risk was very low. Uh, and how about uh, your your training and what you learnt about those uh, about those issues during your during your your training as a junior doctor? Well, certainly hepatitis A um, patients often had infection from hepatitis A, normally from food poisoning, uh, which I was aware of. And of course, from very early on, we were expected to be immunised against hepatitis B, and uh, that was mainly because of uh, our involvement in cannulating patients and the, the, the effect of stick injuries to ourselves. Um, but that was about the limit of my, my knowledge, my working knowledge about hepatitis at that stage. Uh, and when did you become uh, aware, or, or did you become aware, how, how did your knowledge uh, increase about, uh, in respect of hepatitis uh, non-A, non-B, for example? When, do you recall when you first became aware of the risk of, of non-A, non-B from transfusion? Towards the mid to late 80s. Um, it, it was, as you, as you correctly say, known as non-A, non-B, because we didn't know, we knew it wasn't A and we knew it wasn't B. But that was the limit. At the same stage, there were obvious uh, developments in, in transfusion-related infections. HIV had come on the scene in the early 80s. But most of that fear and knowledge came from the media. And uh, my understanding and my, my education in those areas was, was scant. We weren't, it wasn't addressed in the anaesthetic training. And it wasn't uh, part of the discussion with your consultants on ward rounds or in meetings and so Not on? At that stage. Not at that stage. Not at that stage. And can you recall when you first became aware that non-A, non-B or hepatitis C could lead to serious liver disease? Yeah, that would have been at about 1990, I suppose. I believe there was a, a panorama programme, which I, I watched at the time, showing that many people had been infected from infected blood products. And suddenly that stimulated an interest, because it went parallel with another interest I was developing, which was the autologous transfusion. Um, and so I became very interested at that stage. And so it was a personal, uh, a, a personal uh, role to try and educate myself better. So w w I know it's difficult to put dates on these things, but I I is what you're saying that, that in fact, your, your um, knowledge about these, uh, the risks of these viruses came from the research and interest that you yourself had. Um, I, I, is that right? Well, the, the, the knowledge about hepatitis A, non-A, non-B and HIV didn't come from any research that I did. I became aware that it could be transmitted through blood transfusion. I was involved heavily in blood transfusion in my day-to-day -day work, and so I became very interested in trying to avoid transfusion, if at all necessary. Now you, as we, we, we um, spoke about earlier, were the regional advi advisor and educational advisor um, uh, between 1993 and 2005. Were you teaching anything or was anything being taught um, uh, 
that you can recall to uh, junior doctors about blood safety and the use of blood transfusions? No, there were lectures at some of the meetings I went to or organised that often had the topic of hepatitis C and its prevalence and the development and diagnosis of, of that disease. Um, but transfusion itself was not directly addressed. And was there anything taught um, that you can recall about the fact that uh, patients had been um, infected with hepatitis C, with HIV, with hepatitis B as a result of their treatment? C certainly there were protocols put in place about how we would deal with people that had suspected infection. Um, I seem to recall that, in fact, we were, we were taught that we should treat everybody as if they were positive, and therefore that would be the safest route of action. Uh, so in a way, there was no prejudice against people who were infected, or no extra precautions taken, <coughs> um, but generally, gloving, um, hand safety, safety with needles and sharps, the provision of, uh, of boxes to dispose of sharps, it be be became centre to, to our practice. So moving on then to ask you about your practice um, in 1989 when you took up your post as a consultant anaesthetist with a special interest in um, ICU. Um, is it right to understand from your statement that in the early years of your consultant post you were carrying out uh, work on surgical, and uh, surgical lists and an obstetric delivery suite, but at some point your... Uh, you, you stopped doing that kind of work and you were working um, solely on the ICU. Yes, toward, towards the end of the 90s, uh, I became much more focused just on ITU matters. So a period of 10 years or there, thereabouts where you had the, had, were working in, in, a, in a number of different specialisms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you tell us in your statement that initially you were doing two half days on the obstetric obstetric delivery suite and two full days in, in the vascular surgery lists a week. Mm -hmm. is that, is that, that, and was, did that remain the case for, for that period? For, for most of that decade, yes. Um, in both of those contexts, um, who would be the clinician making the decision uh, about the use of blood? Would it be you or would it be the obstetrician or the vascular surgeon? In most of those instances, we'd be working together, usually in the same room, with the same patient. And so it would become evident that uh, blood was being lost. And uh, my, my role was really uh, the physiological and pathophysiological monitor of that blood loss and how much the patient could sustain safely without the need for transfusion. Um, so it was a, a joint decision very often although we both would influence each other uh, during the course of that individual patient's care. And did you, um, in, that, in those contexts, were you ever put in a position where you disagreed with the decision that would be made in relation to blood? I don't think it ever got to a disagreement. There would be a debate very often. And in fact, over the 10 years that I worked with a vascular surgeon in question, um, he changed his philosophy completely on his transfusion uh, practice. Um, and uh, trust develops. He began to trust my judgment when it was needed, and we actually led a, a quite a successful outcome by withholding transfusion, and mortality improved, uh, and yet we were still using less blood transfusion. That's not to say we eliminated it completely, but our practices change. And what was the driver for you of that approach? It was mainly this very uh, low level of knowledge I had about hepatitis C and hepatitis uh, and HIV being, being dangerous through blood transfusion. Um, so that was my main driver. There was a degree of serendipity involved in that the anaesthetic assistant um, he's somebody who, in fact, helps in every way during the anaesthesia to give you the right things and tools you need, was also a trained 
perfusionists in cardiac surgery. And he had available at the time a machine that would recycle spilt blood from the abdomen. And we decided that uh, after discussion with the surgeon, that would be something we could use in vascular surgery. It was already being used in hepatic and cardiac surgery elsewhere. So it was a proven technology, but hadn't been applied strictly only to, to vascular surgery at that stage. Uh, and this, um, the, the period of time you're talking about here, is, is at the beginning of your consultant post, is it? 1989 onwards, yes. Um, uh, uh, and so you started using the cell salvage machine in vascular surgery. And, mm. and um, I understand from your witness statement that you then... Um, uh, started to use that also in the orthopaedic surgery that you were um, doing at that, at that time? Well, initially we, we had the loan of, of these machines, um, but with all, all machinery we eventually have to buy it rather than loan it. And so we, uh, we did look into a, a business case for purchasing such a machine, and that occurred in 1992. Now clearly with the driver that we were trying to decrease harm or risk to the patients, the one thing we didn't want to do was to introduce a technology and techniques that may cause harm. So we began the audit of its use immediately uh, from the first patient, and originally only in vascular surgery, but the other surgeons were also interested in it. And so I devised, a, we may come on to it later, but a, a research program to look at see if it was effective in orthopaedic surgery, and the orthopaedic surgeon was very keen to be involved. Uh, and so we did a prospective randomized control study to see of, well, the null hypothesis would be that uh, it made no difference to the blood transfusion requirements. In fact, it had dramatic effects on the amount of blood being used. And that was how the orthopaedic department got involved. So let's, let's look at that, um, uh, that the write-up of that. Um, it's WITN. 6973006 so when this comes up on the screen we'll see that it's a uh, a, a paper published in the British Journal of Anesthetics um, in, accepted for publication in December 2000 autologous blood transfusion in total knee replacement surgery uh, with your name um, at, at the beginning there uh, and it says in the summary we compared allergenic um, blood usage for two groups of patients undergoing total knee replacement surgery. Patients were randomized to receive either their post-operative wound drainage as an autotransfusion after processing or to have this wound drainage discarded. Allergenic blood was transfused in, transfused in patients of either group whose hemophilia, sorry, whose hemoglobin fell below nine grams per deciliter. Only 7% of patients in the autotransfusion group required an allergenic transfusion, compared with 28% in the control group. There was no hospital mortality and only 3% mortality from all causes as the, um, at the study completion, which spanned six months to three years. Um, and there was a higher incidence of infection requiring intervention in the allergenic group. Total patient costs were £113 greater in the autotransfusion group we conclude that in this type of surgery, post-operative cell salvage is a safe and effective method for reducing allergenic blood use. And we can see um, later on in that, down that page that the, 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 the study was of 231 patients. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's and right. And then if we go over to page three, we can see a bit more detail. Um, if we go down the, set, the bottom half of the, the left-hand column, um, so we see um, in, in the control group, 33 patients received allergenic blood. The majority received two units, 6% um, three units, 6% four units, and 12% one unit. There was no significant difference in length of stay, wound healing, serious adverse events, events or mortality, or health-related quality of life six months after surgery. There was a significantly lower 7% incidence of allergenic blood transfusion in the cell salvage group compared with 28% in the controls. 
there was no difference in post-operative mean haemoglobin concentration between the two groups. Um, in relation to transfusion practice, we found significantly fewer readmissions to hospital and visits to general <coughs> practitioners in patients in the autologous blood transfusion group. Infective complications were increased in allergenic recipients with increasing significance if all patients receiving allergenic blood were placed in the allergenic group. Um, and then you note that your study is one of the la largest randomised control trials yet performed. Um, so, um, as, you, uh, as you were saying earlier, this, um, the conclusion of, of this study was that, that there were um, significantly lower uh, allergenic blood transfusions required for patients who had used the cell salvage mm -hmm. machine. The, that, that study followed a smaller pilot study of 100 patients. Um, and just to give it context, uh, prior to the first study, uh, the audit we conducted on blood use in orthopedic surgery for total knee replacements showed that 82% of all patients required a blood transfusion, usually of between two or three units of blood. And so that was the starting point. The first study of only 100 patients, which, which you haven't shown, uh, showed a reduction in that 82% receiving a transfusion down to 18%. In the subsequent, we, we were originally critiqued for that by peer review that we hadn't stuck to a, a strict nine gram trigger. And they said that the withholding of transfusion was the one that was making the effect on decreasing transfusion. So we continued with a further Welsh Assembly government grant to do the RCT of a further 231 patients with a strict trigger and a, a much stricter protocol. And that, in fact, showed that we could reduce transfusion incidence down to 7%. So we were pleased with the result, um, but went with an open mind initially uh, with a null hypothesis that it wasn't going to make any difference. Uh, and may, may, I, may I just ask? The the difference, the first difference that is quoted in the, the paper is the, the difference in the amount of allergenic transfusion, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that means somebody else's blood. Yes. So it doesn't exclude the use of the individual's own blood as has been salvaged. No. no. So in terms of overall use of blood, um, for whatever the, the, the need was thought to be, that would be, would it broadly similar between the groups, except that the non-allergenic group, the autologous group, would get their own blood back, if you like. Indeed, indeed. And I've understood it correctly, then. Yes, yes. And the, um, the decrease in allergenic blood use occurred in both groups. Yes. So that effect in the allergenic group was, I think, uh, as a result of education of the surgeons that were transfusing the blood as well as other protocols we'd put in place, which showed that just by uh, a more fastidious, inquisitive mind about the need for blood and withholding transfusion according to physiological need, we could reduce the amount of allergenic blood used as well, without cell salvage. But the, now the other findings which you, you have immediately following that, uh, really, do they indicate that there is actually a health benefit to a person in having their own blood back rather than have somebody else's blood put in. Indeed, it, see, it seemed the, the blood that is salvaged during the cell salvage process is fresh blood. It is the patient's own blood. It has been physiologically active in carrying oxygen up until the moment it leaves the body. It only leaves the knee wound in knee replacement surgery and is then recycled within an hour or two of, of that hemorrhage. And so that's of physiological benefit to that patient because there is no antigen within that blood. It is their blood. The trouble with stored blood, although it, it is life-saving, I'm not saying, uh, that it is stored at four degrees temperature in a blood fridge remote to the patient. You have to cross-match that blood and get it there to the patient and then transfuse it. Even after transfusion, the blood has to come up to body temperature and is accepted by many hematologists and transfusionists that it takes probably about six hours before those cells are carrying oxygen 
effectively. So possibly after the first 24 hours, there is no difference. Um, but certainly there is a benefit to having your own blood reinfused early on if, if you need it. Did you understand, uh, or, or not, that there might be, I don't know if there is, you can tell me, um, a, a difference in the effectiveness of blood which has been stored for some time? And thinking of anything else that might be stored in a, in a fridge, it may slowly um, decline in potency, if you like, or uh, acceptability um, be, be, before the, in, in common experience, the sell-by date or the use-by date. Certainly. Uh, is it the same with blood? It is exactly the same with blood. I, I'm not an expert in blood transfusion storage, but my understanding is that most allergenic blood is, can be stored for up to 35 days. Um, during that time, there is a deterioration in quality of that blood, and it has to have a minimum uh, set of qualities set by the transfusion uh, services to, to allow it to be transfused. And that's why it has to be transfused within the 35 days, because it starts to deteriorate. The red cell, which is normally a very effective carrier of oxygen, is an elliptical shape and squeezes down capillaries very well. With storage at four degrees and the lack of, um, I'm getting a bit technical, but the lack of the integrity of the cell membrane, it becomes more like a, a rice cracker. It, it, it becomes bloated and uneven, and it's not a streamlined blood cell that can conduct oxygen carriage. And for that reason, it often takes, that there, are, there is obviously dispersal of those red cells in storage as well. So you have a decreased amount of red cells available because they destroy in storage. Uh, but most of them can, once they warm up, retain their elliptical shape and become efficient. And uh, you know, I wouldn't for a minute wish to say that it's not an effective treatment, but autologous blood can be seen to be more efficient at delivering oxygen, which is the purpose of having the blood there in the first place. So however uh, uh, young or old the, the stored blood might be within the 35-day period, the, the, the chances are, are, are they, that the, uh, the autologous blood will, as you saw it, be uh, if slightly better? For the yes, patient. and, and part, part of the complication with the increased testing and improved quality of the blood provided by the blood services means that it's no longer available as fresh blood. I think the average issue of, of allergenic blood in the UK is around 11 to 12 days after collection. Yes. So it is already deteriorating by the time it is issued compared to autologous blood. Yes, thank you very much. And to us, Thomas, does it follow from that that the autologous blood from the cell salvage process is better than the autologous blood from a deposit made by somebody prior, uh, days or weeks before a planned surgery, for example. It, exactly the same principle applies to autologous blood that is pre-deposited. That has been stored at four degrees. It undergoes the same deterioration because it is a species issue. It's not uh, whether it's your own blood or not. If it, it's the process of storage that is a problem. And... That, combined with the European Blood Directive, meant that pre-deposit fell out of flavour for that reason. You say in your statement that you didn't realise at the time that you started using cell salvage how, um, how, how rare it was in, in the UK. Is, is that right? Yes, I'd been using it for three, four years. And at the end of the first year of using it after purchasing machines... I was asked to give a talk to the anaesthetic department in Cardiff. Um, and I shrugged my shoulders and said, well, clearly you must all be doing this. But they weren't. So I, I did then contact other people in the UK. And at the time, there were three or four of us heavily involved in cell salvage at the time. Um, so, yeah, it came as a bit of a surprise to me. Really. And um, you describe in your witness statement, and it's clear from... Uh, many of the committees and so on that you've been involved in that you've spent a significant amount of your professional 
career um, advancing the cause of cell salvage. Is, is, would that be fair? It's an uphill struggle to, to convince people, uh, particularly if you have a lack of randomised controlled evidence. Um, good things get accepted very quickly, and things with evidence get accepted very quickly. But to persuade cynical clinicians to change their practice is, is very, very difficult. It takes, takes a lot of legwork walking around the country. So, so the difficulty has been, has it, get, getting the, getting the randomised trials up and running? Yes, and, and that, that one we did in knee replacements. If you look at the Cochrane database, there are still only 1,000 patients that have been randomised in a randomised controlled study to look at its effectiveness. And 350 of those came from Morrison. And that's worldwide. And that's, and that's because clinicians are not willing to, to, to change their practice, even for the randomised control? No, I think they have accepted the evidence. They've accepted the evidence. And um, effective treatments are adopted very quickly. If you look at aspirin and heart attacks and things, these, these become established practices very quickly. And I, and I think that was the benefit of cell salvage. It could be seen clinically immediately and on the other hand if you audited the use of, of blood you saw that you're using much much less allogeneic blood in those particular individuals. So although it, it was an uphill struggle I think the words you used it, it, it was it has been accepted now as, as standard practice? Yes uh, uh, through, through the group that we, we tried to develop which is the um, the the, uh, in, the UK Cell Salvage Action Group, which you may or may not come, come on to. It's a, it's a group backed by the, the MBS and all the other blood services in the UK to provide information on best use of cell salvage. They conducted an audit, and I think the last audit showed there are, that it is available in 85% of all hospitals in the UK. It's not always relevant for each clinical case, but it is available, which is the important thing. Uh, and so, um, just um, in, in terms of the uphill struggle nature of, of getting to where to where we are now, were you disappointed with the reception that you got initially from this the the, the, the um, randomised control trial we just looked at? No, I think it became it became accepted practice amongst orthopaedic surgeons. And, and they certainly changed their practice. There was a slightly different process used by some of them, which was unwashed post-operative cell salvage, um, which is slightly different. The, the, the system we were using was a washed system and required a technician to, to operate it. The unwashed uh, was purely collecting the wound drain blood, filtering it, and giving it straight back to the patient. So it was a much easier process, but nevertheless can be considered as autologous transfusion. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that it was accepted amongst that subgroup very, very well, and they adopted very quickly. Um, turning then to your um, uh, your work on the IC in ICU, um, and you've said that in your witness statement that as a result of having increased the size of the IC unit from ICU from eight beds to 26 beds, um, you then worked full time um, full time on, on the ICU mm -hmm. from, from the end of the end of the 1990s. Um, what were the broad circumstances in which you were involved in making decisions about administering blood, blood components, blood products um, for patients in the ICU? It, it was usually the decision of the consultant on call for the day to make those decisions, particularly in the acute instances. Um, we, we deal with a, a wide spectrum of, of illnesses, um, trauma victims, people after stabbings, road traffic accidents, and they are often in dire need of blood transfusion. And so that process happened very quickly. If it were a decision on whether to transfuse a post-operative stable patient or not, um, then we would clearly have time to consult with 
the admitting consultant and decide on whether transfusion was required or not. Um, but parallel to that development, other RCTs were coming out showing that restrictive transfusion practices also did not cause harm in ITU patients as they did in the knee replacement surgery. And your practice, as you tell us in your statement, um, was that you would not transfuse a patient if their haemoglobin level was below 90 grams per milliliter. Um, and for younger patients without comorbidities, that level was often lower, le often 70. Yeah, I think the, initially when we picked 9 grams, um, I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant, but we picked it because it was next to 10, and people accepted that 10 was safe. Nine seemed to be perfectly okay and not physiologically much different. So it was pushing the boundaries a little further down, but not so unacceptable that people wouldn't comply with that guideline. Uh, I, I think just for the transcript, Ms. Scott, um, your, your question uh, was meant to be uh, that unless it is below nine grams, uh, you wouldn't transfuse. Am I, am I That's right? right, nine grams or less. Uh, I think the way it's, it's come across is, is it looks as though you're saying if it, if it was, uh, what's it? Um, it's, uh, to, yes. it's passed, passed my, on the, yes. my transcript, but it, it, it got it wrong, I think. Yes. Um, yes. So just, just to correct that, I'm sorry Thank for you. interrupting. Um, so, uh, as you say, you, you picked that on the basis that it was just below 10, presumably as a result of looking at the guidelines, looking at studies... Indeed, read, with... reading a lot of the textbooks around that, they said that uh, blood transfusion was certainly required below 7 grams. Uh, 9 grams seemed a, a nice in-between figure. Uh, but there were some, even the knee replacement patients that I referred to earlier would be sometimes leaving hospital with a higher haemoglobin than they came in with because of transfusion. That's unnecessary transfusion. They didn't need that. And take you to a, um, a document, um, uh, NHBT 20099310 underscore 002, just to see whether or not that was a document um, in fact, this is a document from 1988, so just before your uh, time uh, as a consultant. See whether this is a, a document that you recognised uh, and saw at the time. You can see that it's the Handbook of Transfusion Medicine by the NBTS and the SNBTS. Um, is, that, is that a document that you s were aware of at the time? I'm aware of now, and I'm aware of later editions, which I helped formulate, but at the time... I was completely unaware that that was a book in existence at all. So if we, we, we've looked at this, we've looked at this before, but we can see if we turn over to page three of this document, um, who it was um, aimed at, who this book is for. This book is for staff who are responsible for prescribing or administering blood products, but that's not, not something that ever came to your attention. Not at the time. Um, and, and then we can see at page uh, 21, yes, page 21, uh, what's said there about perioperative transfusion, the trigger for red cell replacement, um, and, and it says there um, uh, surgical and anaesthetic practice is tended to be guided by the belief that a haemoglobin level below 10 indicates a need for perioperative red cell transfusion little or no firm evidence supporting this belief and experience in recent years suggests that patients with severe anemia may tolerate anaesthesia and operation without major morbidity or mortality resulting from um, anemia itself. Evidence from clinical and um, physiological studies does not support the necessity for the 10G rule. Um, experimental evidence indicates that in healthy humans, cardiac output does not increase dramatically until the haemoglobin falls below 7G. The healthier anaesthetized primates survive a hematocrit down to 5% when breathing oxygen. And then, um, uh, so then, missing out the next paragraph, as a guide, patients who are otherwise healthy with a haemoglobin of 10G or greater rarely require perioperative transfusion. Acute anemia with a haemoglobin below 7G will generally require red cell transfusion. 
some patients with chronic anemia, such as those with chronic renal failure, tolerate hemoglobin values below 7G and withstand anesthesia and surgery at this level. The decision to transfuse red cells will depend on clinical assessment and may require laboratory data such as arterial oxygenation, oxygen extraction ratio and blood volume. So reading that now, is that um, uh, set out there, is that consistent with the, with the practice and policy that you've described to us? I think, I think it describes perfectly what we were trying to achieve. The, this, the, the 1030 rule was something that, although I hadn't seen the document, I was well aware of, and that was taught quite widely. You've, you've told us in your witness statement that there was a great inconsistency of practice between your colleagues at this time, um, and you've said that that was because there was no protocol or guidance in place uh, that you could point at to, um, or, or that clinicians could could, could um, uh, rely on. Is, is that have, have I have I understood that correctly? Yes, and I, I, obviously these guidelines were in place at that time, but we were unaware of it. And, and I was listening earlier on to the previous witness when you questioned him about uh, my comment that most people don't read the guidelines. Well, anaesthetists don't read hematological guidelines on platelet transfusion. They need to be fed that information in a specific digestible way uh, so that what you really want to do is to have a change in behavior. You don't necessarily want them to, to read all the documents. And so they have to have a trusted individual, a conduit of that information to give them best guidance. And I think that distillation is, can be very effectively clinically. So your comment in, in the witness statement or your, your, your evidence in the witness statement about, about um, colleagues reading guidelines wasn't that they don't read any guidelines, it's that... They read uh, guidelines relevant to themselves. Relevant to them. So an anaesthetist, you would, you would expect, and, and indeed did your anaesthetist colleagues, for example, read the guidelines coming from the Royal College of Anaesthetists? They did. They did. Um, and and haematologists, you would expect to read the, the guidelines coming from their Royal College and their, their professional bodies. But... But it's the it's the crossover between the two that where 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 clinicians are not reading each other's guidelines, if I can put it that way. Indeed. Um, and so, um, can you give us a, a little uh, more insight into the inconsistency of practice that you saw at, at this time when you had become a consultant? How did that manifest? Well. There's one particular instance that sticks in my mind, um, not mentioning any identifiers at all, but a, a, an anaesthetist within the hospital was transfusing three units of blood to a knee replacement patient. Um, at the time, the surgery was undertaken under tourniquet, which means that the leg is exsanguinated of blood, there's a tight tourniquet applied, and the surgery is undertaken in a bloodless field. So this patient had not lost any blood at all at the time that was going on. Um, and I happened to be in that theater at the time. I called in to, to ask my colleague something. And he said, well, knee replacement surgery always requires three units of blood. Needless to say, he changed his mind eventually after gentle persuasion, education about the principles. But that's a, a very time-consuming way of doing it. And that gave me uh, enthusiasm to try and produce guidelines that would be easily digestible and adopted by a far wider audience. Uh, and you, you tell us in your witness statement that as part of the work with the Hospital Transfusion Committee, and I'll come on to ask you a bit more detail about that, but you did in fact introduce what you called a simple guidance um, on which to base transfusion of red cells for all hospital patients in, in the hospital, is that right? Yes. Um, uh, um, uh, and how was that, what, what form did that take? Was that, was that written guidance? It was a written guidance issued by the Hospital Transfusion Committee. The, the HDC was formed in 1993 uh, as a follow-on from my interest in the introduction of cell salvage. Um, where we issued uh, a transfusion guidance, and that was that 90 grams um, per, per litre 
was the level at which we should start considering transfusion and not above, um, that there needed to be a recent assessment of hemoglobin concentration on which to base the need for that transfusion, obviously, because you're using a figure, uh, but that the clinician on the spot in an emergency situation out of hours at night would be right and would be able to demand that blood and we would investigate it if it was over transfusion subsequently. But it was meant to be helpful to try and curtail excessive use of, of allogeneic product but not to limit clinical freedom. And the simplicity of it was that it applied across the board, across the specialists, yes. across the patient groups. Um, and that was them. partly why we, we picked 90 grams. That was safe even for people who are elderly, perhaps with cardiovascular disease. So it was a catch-all. Uh, obviously, individuals could be assessed differently and could be very fit individuals. May not need to be transfused at that level, but that was the simplicity that made it successful. And, and how was that received by your colleagues? Well, in the main, yes. Uh, most of them complied with it. I say most. Um, a bleeding situation is very difficult to assess, and we know that blood transfusion saves lives when you're bleeding to death. Um, so to be too judgmental on people's clinical behaviour is, is a little bit difficult. Um, can we look then at another document, DHSC 00208130059? Sorry? Yes, DHSC 00208130059. Um, here we've got a, a publication, um, Blood Transfusion and the Anaesthetist, Red Cell Transfusion, published by the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland from September 2001. Now, you, you, you told us in your statement that the um, publication of this booklet um, was very helpful uh, to your practice. Can you, can you explain to us why, why that was? Well, it was a distillation of, of things we'd been trying to do at a local level. Um, it took until 1999 to start getting involved with, with bodies such as the Association of Anesthetists and the Royal College of Anesthetists. Um, but I was helped in, in putting this leaflet together by Professor Mike Murphy, um, Dame Marcella Contreras, big, uh, well-known people within the transfusion era who came on the committee and helped formulate um, the guidance that, that we tried to put in bullet point in this, in this booklet. Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at the, the detail of it in a moment, but you, you said in your statement that, that it gave you a publication to base your practice on and, if necessary, defend your actions to surgical colleagues. Can you just tell us a, a bit more about, about uh, the context in which you make those, the, the, those statements? Yes, I think that when you're trying to persuade a surgical colleague that this is something we could address, um, or, or the chief executive, for that matter, of, of, of the hospital or the the governance board, that, that you're doing things according to a national guideline. There's approved by uh, a number of, uh, of people uh, coming from disparate uh, groups and specialties, and so has an authentic ring to it. Um, and certainly we would not have been able to put anything in that document that was not true, not validated, and not relevant. And so suddenly you had a very simplistic publication that they could refer to and, and base their practice on. Let's look at the detail of it. We can see on page three of that document um, who the members of the working party were. Uh, as you say, you're the chair, um, and then we see a number of names um, that we recognise there. Uh, as you say, Professor Contreras and, uh, and um, the then Dr. Dr. Murphy. Um, if we then go over to page 10... Um, we can see um, the guidelines under section 7 on the left hand side uh, and, and it's there norm normally patients not to be transfused if haemoglobin concentration above 7 
strong indication for transfusion if it's below, sorry, above 10, strong indication for transfusion if below 7, becomes essential when um, haemoglobin decreases to 5, um, between 8 and 10 is a safe level even for patients with significant cardiorespiratory disease. Symptomatic patients should be transfused. So straightforward, simple, easy to, to, to see and understand at a glance. Is that, was that the, the aim of it? That, that was the aim of it. It took an enormous amount of time to get everybody to comply with them. But, uh, it, with the writing of the guidelines, I mean, there's much debate. But yes, I think it was simplistic in its final form. Um, and then uh, we can see um, uh, on the uh, over the, on the other side, we can see some information about risks of infection. Uh, blood can be regarded as a drug with uh, risks inherent in its use. The public expects to be offered zero risk. It's highly unlikely that this can be achieved. The initiative should ensure that patients are aware of the current risks associated with allergenic transfusion. NBS leaflets are available and can help patients with this information. And I'll come on in uh, a little bit later on to ask you some questions about consenting patients and, and information given to patients and so on. But just to note that that was what was written in those guidelines in 2001. Um, uh, so, uh, you say that you found having this publication extremely helpful in your practice. Do you, was that reflected, do you think, in your clinical colleagues' practice as well? Yes, I think once, once we got it approved by a national body, suddenly it was a, a simple idea and that they were prepared to follow. Um, although you tell us in your statement that still at the time of retirement in 2020, you are still having a debate with some colleagues about whether or not there was a need to transfuse when somebody's haemoglobin was nine or above. Yes. Um, that, would you like me to elaborate? Yes, I would like you to elaborate <laughs> on that, please. Um, careful not to mention names again. I, I, I took my pension in, in 2014 and was asked to take a role of director of the cardiac ITU up subsequently, which I did for seven years. And there were instances there where there were patients who were I think definitely over transfused. When we drilled down to see the reason for that, it was normally people who had hemorrhaged significantly in theatre, were in fact perhaps bleeding to death, and a degree of over transfusion occurred, uh, and that is perfectly acceptable. Um, uh, my role was in the intensive care and not in the operating theatre. So I, I took that as a clinical need that was judged at the time. However, there would be instances then in the post-operative period where some patients would have a haemoglobin of nine or above, and some clinicians would want a unit or two of blood to be given because they said that they would recover better. And there is no doubt that people don't die at nine grams. They may recover a little bit quicker, but when you've had cardiac surgery, your recovery is slow anyway, and whether that justifies transfusion or not, is a room for debate. And so I had that discussion frequently with them, uh, certainly about red cell transfusion, but also a platelet transfusion, mostly in the stable post-operative patient. So what you're trying to do is curtail unnecessary transfusion and not making any judgment on their clinical practice in the throes of, of cardiac surgery. Uh, um do you have any insight as, uh, as to why, given the wealth of guidance, um, evidence-based practice about over-transfusion by uh, the, the, the dates we're talking about, 20, the, the, the early 20, well, late 2015, 2016, 2017, why there was such a reluctance on, some, on the part of some clinicians to accept that? I don't know the secret to that uh, because I had 50% of the clinicians that were very constrained in their use of red cell and other products in that same period. Um, and so there was a determination amongst the others not, not to listen. In fact, they would uh, refer to me as the blood doctor whenever they saw me and clearly feeling uneasy that their practice was, was one of... Um, an, an ease 
that they were doing it, but they felt more comfortable with a higher hemoglobin. And um, all, all sorts of things go on on a cardiac ITU, um, unpredictable things. Uh, and so they probably will take a, a, a little longer before we can remove their safety blanket. ask you some questions about single unit transfusions. How common was the practice of single unit transfusions in Morriston and Singleton when you first took up your post at, as a consultant? Or indeed, how common was it in your um, post as junior, a junior doctor? I, di I didn't ever use single transfusion myself at that time. Uh, probably because my bosses were, were keen not to. Uh, and I think I've read somewhere in, in the documents that, uh, you know, if, if one unit is, is, is all that's needed, it's not necessary. And that's fine if you have a liberal transfusion practice. If you're going to give something for a symptomatic patient, you may as well give two than one. My, my view now is that if you're going to try and restrict transfusion to a, a transfusion trigger or a target of, of 90 grams, then it would be valid to give a one unit transfusion in that situation because it gets you over the line, over the 90. You don't need to give two because the inherent risks with giving two units are double the risk of giving one. And if you've set a target for 90 and, and one unit will take you over 90, then there is justification for a one unit transfusion. So I think during that period of time, Practice has changed, the reason for transfusion has changed, and so there's a subtle difference, but I think a significant difference in reasoning as to why single unit transfusion is justified nowadays. And so that you're, you're describing there, your, your practice, in terms of seeing the practice of other clinical colleagues, was there, did you come across the um, ethos of topping up, or let, let, let's give a single unit to top up, or as you say, let's give they need one, let's give them two just to be safe. Was that, a, was that something you came across in, in your practice? Oh, yes, and undoubtedly in the, in the early 90s that was occurring quite a lot. And how difficult was that to change? I think if, again, through the Hospital Transfusion Committee, uh, because we audited blood use, it was quite e easy to identify the ones that were offending repeat offenders, if you like, and, and you then focus on those individuals and see if you can persuade them uh, to, to change their practice. And you have described a, um, a process of uh, red cell units being released one at a time. Um, can you tell us how that system worked in practice? I was very fortunate to be working with uh, a scientific officer in the blood bank who was enthusiastic as I was about limiting unnecessary transfusion and she instilled in her staff um, a questioning by the biomedical scientists of the clinicians ordering the blood as to whether it was needed. One, one was did they comply with all the, the suggestions we've made, recent hemoglobin estimate is the patient stable? Is it required overnight, for instance? Can it be transfused the next morning to slow down the process? But in an emergency situation, we always try to promote the instant release of adequate supplies, regardless uh, of, of other things, uh, because the clinicians would be in distress and wanting the blood quickly. And we then tend to investigate that at a later stage. And so in those circumstances, the system was, yes, you can have a unit, and then if you need another unit, you can have another unit. Is, is that how that... That's in stable right? patients. In what so we had to try and do is discourage people in a major hemorrhage situation from releasing one at a time, which is clearly impossible. When it takes 20 minutes to get it from the blood bank to the, the patient, then by the time you've got, finished one, you haven't got the next one left. So we would issue it. That was part of the work later on in, in, in massive hemorrhage protocols and release of blood. Just in terms of digging in a little bit more about the process that you've just been talking about of, of ordering blood from the blood, blood bank, um, when were 
when did blood ordering schedules co come into play at Morriston and Singleton? Probably at about the same time as we formed the Hospital Transfusion Committee. Prior to that, there were there was data coming out about uh, cross-match to transfusion ratios. So people would order blood for a procedure, and we would audit how much of that blood was used, whether it was used at all. And so the cross-match order to transfusion of one meant that everything that was cross-matched was used. But it rarely occurred like that. Very often there was over-ordering. And an easier and more simplistic way was to say, well, in this category of patients undergoing this procedure at this institution, normally three units of blood is sufficient. In others, you never use the blood. You order it, but you never use it. So therefore, we will do a group and save, not saying you can't have the blood in an emergency. But that altered practice. People, I, I referred very briefly to safety blankets. People felt safe if there was blood available, if needed, but not necessity to use it. And so that was a subtle change from cross-match to transfusion, which was a retrospective to a schedule that was prospective. And they said, well, this is an aortic aneurysm. You don't need 10 units of blood. We normally do, do three, for example. And that changed the demand on blood, uh, blood requirements. And uh, you described the um, role that the scientific officers and laboratory officers took in that process, the questioning. Um, presumably that was much easier for them once there were schedules in place because they were able to... Refer to, say, to something. Yes, refer to something. And indeed may not even have to ask the question because hopefully the practice is to, to order it in line with the schedule. Is that, is that in fact what happened? That, that's what happened in, in, in the main. And... Um, I've got to admire the, the biomedical scientists for, for, their, um, for their efforts in, in trying to persuade clinicians not to use blood when it was against schedule. But that was always an area of, of great conflict. Um, people under pressure, when they, they want to transfuse blood, don't usually take telling very well. And uh, smoothing those those uh, edges between the two departments w took a lot of lot of work, but trust develops eventually. And I think the MS boss gave people that trust that it was a reasonable thing to be suggesting. I'm going to ask you some questions now about your practice in relation to consent, um, and obtaining consent. Um, from patients to blood transfusion. Um, what role would you have had in consenting patients for treatment in your obstetric and surgical work? What role did you have? Usually I was uh, involved in either anaesthetizing or performing regional blocks on, on patients in those situations. Consent for the procedure was often taken by the surgeon so my role was uh, minimal in, in that area until I developed an interest in autologous transfusion when I, I would feel obliged to explain to them the alternatives that were available should a blunt transfusion be required, that uh, we would use the cell saver to try and minimize the amount of allogeneic exposed. Um, that was verbal. It wasn't... a, a I mean, a formal uh, communication with them. And it certainly wasn't informed consent. I was informing them of the possibility, but to give true informed consent, they need that information way before the time of the anaesthetic's in involvement. So that would be a, a conversation in, in the theatre? Usually on the ward prior to them going to theatre, yeah. Uh, and so, um, uh, and would that conversation, when you were discussing the, the use of the cell salvage m um, machine, would that include giving information about the risks of viral infection from uh, transfusion? No. The, very often in, in vascular surgery, elective infrarenal aneurysm repairs, for example, carry a, a risk of death of about uh, 5% or less. 
these days it's much less, but uh, in those days it was about 3% to 5%, which is a risk of death, 1 in 20. And as you saw from even the booklet in 2001, the risk from hep C was, was very much lower than that. And when people are either going to have a baby or a significant surgical procedure, the last thing, uh, well, we weren't knowledgeable enough on the precise risk from hep C and HIV at the time, but knew that it was being, we thought, taken care of by the blood services, certainly since the 1990s. Uh, blood issued was very, very much safer than it had been previously. Uh, and did the amount of information you gave to patients change over time? Very much so, very much so. Be because of the accent on informed consent, we felt obliged to produce documents that could be made available to those who were interested. We tried to issue those at uh, a pre-anesthetic uh, clinic for those that we suspected would be requiring blood transfusion. And then it was free access online to many of these documents. And so it was a, a combination, was it, of discussion at a, at a pre-anesthetic clinic with written patient leaflets and referral to websites and so on for, for, for further yes. written information. Uh, and we saw, we saw the recommendation in the 2001 booklet we looked at earlier where that was said to be the practice that was, was expected. Are you able to give us an indication as to when the pre-anesthetic clinic and this new improved consenting process started to be used by you and your colleagues? Probably towards the end of, of uh, 2009, 2010, um, we had great difficulty getting funding for our pre-anesthetic clinics, um, which clearly um, are, are very useful. The demand on beds within a hospital meant that people were often cancelled just prior to either their appointment as a, as a pre-anesthetic clinic or their bed became non-available for the elective surgery. Um, but nevertheless, uh, an, a pre-anesthetic clinic became essential for many procedures that certainly required major surgery or blood transfusion. Uh, and you, you told us in your witness statement that the standard surgical consent form in use even, even when you retired in 2020 um, only included a catch-all phrase um, that there was a, a possibility um, that there a catch-all phrase about a possibility about um, requiring blood transfusion with no particular information given about the risks. That's right. That's right. So if somebody was not going to be attending a pre-anaesthetic clinic, then that they may not have had any... In emergency cases may not be conscious at the time of that consent is being sought, um, and there is a consent form that we use when we get two practitioners who deem it is necessary for that procedure. Um, but even in emergency situations, aside from that, that is all the discussion that they get is the standard NHS consent form. So you would expect that that, that um, a standard surgical consent form to only be used in emergency situations where there hadn't been a chance to have... Uh, in other words, all, all, all patients should have been offered a, a pre-anesthetic uh, clinic. Or elective. Yes patients should, should have the opportunity to be assessed pre -anesthetically. Um And just one more question for me before we break. Um, if blood was given in an unforeseen emergency, so there hadn't been any opportunity to, to get consent, give information and so on, was it your practice to tell patients that this had happened? It became essential to inform them that they'd had a blood transfusion. Um, particularly after the 1996 variant CJD issue, because that meant they were eliminated from the donor pool. And so it became more pressing that they were informed of that at that stage. So it would now be an appropriate time to take a break. Uh, yes, it would. Um, shall we take a break then until quarter to four? Now, uh, during this, this break, uh, Doctor, you're, you're, uh, you're under a, 
uh, oath you, you are giving evidence, you, you are not allowed to talk to anyone about the evidence you have given or any evidence you suspect you may yet be asked about. You can talk about anything else, whatever it is. I understand. 